Let me once again formally welcome you all to the 102nd inaugural lecture to be delivered by a distinguished professor of pediatrics from the Department of Pediatrics, Faculty of Clinical Sciences, of Bankemi Awolowo College of Health Sciences, Chagam. Of course, the lecture is to be delivered by Professor Mrs. Musili Bolanle Fertuga. Can we give her a round of applause? Shall we all rise now for the academic procession of the principal officers and other distinguished academics of this great university? Because the university management is under the leadership of our people, Vice Chancellor, Professor Ganiyu Olatuji Olatunde. Leading today's procession is the Acting Dean Student Affairs, Dr. Maruf Olajimeji. Dr. Maru Polajimeji is closely followed by the Acting Dean Faculty of Health Environmental Sciences, Dr. Bashir Odufuwa. He is closely followed by the Dean Faculty of Engineering, Dr. Abayomi Layeni. Dr. Layeni is followed by the Dean Faculty of Agricultural Management and Rural Development, Professor Adiwale Onosoya. Professor Onosoya is followed by the Dean Faculty of Arts. He is no other person than Professor Samson Gary. And of course, Professor Samson Gary is closely followed by the Dean Faculty of Pharmacy, Dr. Latif Kassim. Next to the Dean Faculty of Pharmacy is the Dean Faculty of Basic Medical Sciences, Professor Mrs. O.A. Ogudansi. Professor Ogudansi is closely followed by the Dean Faculty of Science, Professor Lawrence Adibajo. Next to Professor Adibajo is the Dean Faculty of Education, Professor Olufemi Kalesanwo. Next to Professor Kale Sawo is the Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor Israel Ademi Lui. Next to the Dean Faculty of Social Sciences is the Dean Faculty of Administration and Management Sciences. Is no any other person than Professor Haruko C. Shomoye. Professor Shomoye is closely followed by the, the Provost. College of Agricultural Sciences, Professor K.B. Oluri. And of course, next to him is the Provost of Akemi Aulawa College of Health Sciences, Shagam Professor Ego Olatunji. Next to Professor Olatunji is the Provost of Postgraduate School, Professor O.E. Lawal. Next to Professor Lawal is the University Bursa, Mr. Semil Makide, FCA. Next to the university boss is the university librarian. Is there any other person than, than Dr. Adibango Oduwole? Next to Dr. Adibango Oduwole is the registrar of the university, Mr. Femi Ogumomuchu. And of course, the deputy vice chancellor of administration, Professor Charles Olufemi Adikoya. And of course, the inaugural lecturer of today, Professor Mrs. Musili Walanle Petuga. He is being honored <laughs> by our Amir Rupa Chancellor, Professor Galiyu Olatuji Olatunde, ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic, Professor Ayodeji Aguola. <laughs> Shall we offer our seat, please? Mr. Fashion Salon, 
this is a real privilege for me to now invite the party registrar, Mr. This is not a lecture, hopefully. Mr. Registrar. Principal officers of the universities, provosts, dames, members of senate, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the vice chancellor, I have my declare this is a declaration of open. May I again invite the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic, Professor Deji Agola, to please come forward and introduce the inaugural lecturer of today, Professor Mrs. Musili Bolani Fetuga. Deputy Vice Chancellor. Citation of Professor Mrs. Mosley Bolani Fetuga. Aladi Yakini, a Miola Ladiki, and Mrs. Monisola Aduke Ladiki of Lako Lako Lu Compact Abebi in a battle. Abebi in a battle. She had an elementary education at the Methodist Primary School, the Good Tedo from 1966 to 1971, where she was always in the first position in the middle classes with numerous prizes. Thereafter, she proceeded to Yeji Day Girls Grammar School, Molete Ibadan, for her secondary school education from 1972 to 1976. She was awarded a Western State Government Scholarship for her secondary education, and she received many prizes and obtained a West African School Certificate in Grade 1. She then proceeded to the Queen's School, Ibadan, as well as the International School, University of Ibadan, where she obtained an Iron School Certificate and General Certificate of Examination of London in 1978. And thereafter, she was ready to put a career in medicine where she got an admission to study medicine at the University of Ibadan in 1979. She completed this program in June 1984 and later obtained a postgraduate diploma in anesthesia from the University of Ibadan in 1992. Professor Mrs. Fetuka had a postgraduate residency training in pediatrics at the then Ogo State University Teaching Hospital, now Olympic Romania University Hospital, where she completed it in 2001, and she was among the pioneer residents of the teaching hospital. She was appointed lecturer one by the Olympic Romania University in August 2001 and a consultant pediatrician at the same teaching hospital in that same year, and she became a senior lecturer in October 2006, and through a blend of hard work,
In the context of our academic and administrative pathway, she has been appointed to serve in different capacities within and outside the university. Within the university, she was the coordinator of the parental examination, select member committee to review the MBCAT curriculum. She was also the complete faculty representative for the Faculty of Clinical Sciences, having held the Department of Pediatrics from 2014 to 2016, and of course, the Dean of Faculty of Clinical Sciences from 2018 to date. Outside the university, she has served as visiting consultant to EA Shubomi Shared Care Center. She has also served as visitor person to various places such as West African College of Physicians, National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria, Pediatrics and Technology Training Center for West Africa, and of course, the Growth in Practice Workshop that took place in Nairobi, Kenya. Professor Musli, Musli Polande Fetuga has both supervised and co supervised postgraduate medical doctors for their award of fellowship in general pediatrics and the soft specialty of pediatrics and endocrinology. She has been an excellent examiner to the Lagos State University as well as the University of Ibadan. She's also an examiner at the West African College of Physicians, Faculty of Pediatrics. She's also a tutor for the Pediatric and Endocrinology Center for West Africa. And this offers also another story graph by the World Diabetes Foundation and the European Society of Pediatry and Endocrinologists with which she proceeded to the Pediatrics and Ecology Training Center for Africa in Nairobi, Kenya from 2008 to 2010. <laughs> Through international collaboration, she also received a travel grant as a visiting researcher to the Growth Research Institute in Sweden in 2013 she was also a visiting clinician to the University of Umea Clinic in Sclepetia, Hamstad. Our inaugural lecturer of today is indeed an academic parasite. Not only does she have 64 publications to accredit in reputable local, regional, and international journals. She has also participated in local regional and international conferences workshop with papers and poster presentations. <laughs> this accomplished scholar is a fellow of the West African College of Pediatricians, fellow of the European Society of Pediatrics and Technologists, member society for pediatrics and adolescent endocrinologists, member of the Nigerian Society of Pediatrics and Adolescent and Ecologists, and of course, the Nigerian Medical Association. <laughs> Professor Mrs. Petuga was happily married to late Dr. Taiwo Adesubomi Petuga of blessed memory, and the marriage is blessed with three wonderful children and grandchildren. Please join me. Welcome to my son, Mrs. Busli, among Polali Petuga, to give the number lecture of today. University Liberian and the Costa. Provost 
of the postgraduate school and colleges, deans of faculty, heads of department, distinguished academic and professional colleagues, non-academic staff, my lord spiritual and temporal who may be present, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, great OOUIs. Preamble, I am very grateful to the Almighty God, the beneficent and the most merciful, for the privilege to deliver the 107 inaugural lecture of this great citadel of knowledge, Olabisi Onobando University, titled that our children may grow, the potential, the challenges, and privileges. This inaugural lecture is the 25th in the series from the Obafemi Aulawa College of Health Sciences, the 16th from the Faculty of Clinical Sciences, the 6th from the Department of Pediatrics, and the first by a female in the Faculty of Clinical Sciences. The lecture offers me an opportunity to render my account as academic staff, report my experiences as a researcher in the field of pediatrics, and highlight my contributions to training and community building in my environment. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, thank you for your kind approval. Introduction. My background has a bearing on my choice of title for this inaugural lecture. By the grace of God, being the first child in a large family has had with it both challenges and privileges. Looking back, I must have been born with potential perhaps unknown to me then as a child growing up. I attended Methodist School, a hotel at Utola Road in Bali. This public school provided me with a solid foundation. There were weekly tests to report cards, and one of my teachers endowed a weekly contribution, cash contribution, to promote a healthy rivalry among pupils. Another great feature of my public primary school education was the compulsory daily school lunch for a minimum token fee of two pence for a balanced diet for all pupils, sold by designated health-educated hygienic school food vendors. I must say my father influenced my choice of medicine as the course of study in the university. He saw the potential in me, guided and encouraged me with the promise of a brand new air-conditioned car. I thank God I was able to and my father fulfilled his promise. It was indeed a great privilege for me in those days. My journey into pediatrics, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, after the rigorous medical school training at the University of Ibadan, following up with an internship at the University College Hospital Ibadan and the National Youth Service, I felt my cup of formal training, education and training in the field of medicine was full. Hence, all I was teaching to do was to work in the public hospital without the rigors of academics. But this desire could not be fulfilled immediately because of the recruitment embargo into the federal and state civil services. I came to the then Ubu State University Teaching Hospital, Shagami, with the hope of working briefly whilst waiting for the embargo to be lifted. It is worthy of note that the migration of medical doctors was becoming right even at that time, as many of my classmates were beginning to leave to practice abroad. The awaited employment letters came shortly after resuming work at the OSU, for by which time I met the man who was to become my husband. I was posted to the Department of Pediatrics by the Chief Medical Director of the hospital, being a pediatrician himself. That was the beginning of my journey into pediatrics. The field of pediatrics, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Pediatrics is the branch of medicine that deals with children's physical, mental, social health, and their diseases. It involves the medical care of newborns, infants, children, and adolescents from birth to 18 years of age. This age limit may vary for cultural or geographical reasons. A medical doctor who specializes in this area is known as a pediatrician. The pediatrician is interested in child nutrition, vaccination, and ensures a child meets the milestones in growth and development. In addition to treating common illnesses, pediatricians have to keep abreast of emerging diseases and health risks for children, 
of which the global COVID-19 pandemic is a vivid example. The word pediatrics means healer of children. Pediatrics is a relatively new subspecialty of medicine. Abraham Jacobi is known as the father of American pediatrics and an advocate for children's health. Pediatrics focuses on all aspects of medical care that a child may need. Importantly, the challenges of growing or developing bodies. Since their bodies are smaller and they enter into different stages of growth throughout the years, the medical needs of children also change drastically with attendant challenges. The goal of pediatric care is to maximize each child's potential. As a result, pediatricians need to understand normal growth and development and recognize abnormalities in this domain. As a broad field, pediatrics comprises several subspecialties, of which pediatric endocrinology is one of them. Indeed, the field of pediatrics is about the entire body of a child, unlike some other subspecialties, which are limited to specific parts or functions of the body. How long does it take to be a pediatrician? It takes five to six years to complete undergraduate medical education, six years for residency training in pediatrics, with research built into professional and academic training. With the challenges of frequent and often prolonged industrial unrest by the various labor unions, please add to these years, X years, kindly also add two years for subspecialty training within or outside the country. Pediatric endocrinology, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I am privileged to be one of the not so many pediatric endocrinologists in this country. In this field, I have been able to train, provide care, and carry out research on growth aspects. Endocrinology is the branch of medicine that has to do with endocrine glands, their hormones and disorders of the endocrine gland, namely the thyroid, adrenal, sexual development, and variations of physical growth, bone metabolism, child, childhood, and adolescent diabetes. Hormones are chemicals that influence the functions of different organ systems in the body. Growth, regulation of body metabolism, and reproduction. Hormones include growth hormone, thyroid hormone, insulin, steroid hormones of the adrenals, and sex hormones. The specialist in this subspecialty is known as an endocrinologist. And for children, pediatric endocrinologist. The, so, the American Society of Pediatric Endocrinologists was founded in 1971. Another long-standing pediatric endocrine association is the European Society of Pediatric Endocrinology, ESPE, which has played a considerable role in my becoming a pediatric endocrinologist today. And recently, the African Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Endocrinology, ESPE, and the Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Endocrinology of Nigeria, SPEL, which I am one of the foundation members. My journey, my journey into pediatric endocrinology, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, my journey into pediatric endocrinology started in 2005 with a sensitization workshop on pediatric endocrinology, the first in Nigeria. The program packaged by SPEL was to start, grow, and develop pediatric endocrinology in Nigeria. The society sent a team of five eminent European pediatric endocrinologists for the purpose. All the university teaching hospitals in Nigeria were requested to send nominees for the workshop at the University of Benin Teaching Hospital. This program was my significant first-hand exposure to the subspecialty of pediatric endocrinology with emphasis on growth and the use of growth charts as the gold standard in assessing the growth potentials and challenges of every child. Three years later, there was a follow-up with my award of a study grant for fellowship training from the World Diabetes Foundation and ESPE, which spans 2008 to 2010 at the Pediatric Training Center for Africa. The training was domiciled in Nairobi, Kenya, at three centers, namely Kenyatta National Hospital, University of Kenya, Gertrude Children Hospital, and Aga Khan University Hospital. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, these grants 
provided a template and an international dimension to my training, experience, and research. I came back to Nigeria, my institution, OOU and OUT, to formally start the Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes Clinic in 2010. Furthermore, I received a travel grant in 2013 as a researcher at the Growth Research Institute, Gothenburg University in Sweden. The funding was facilitated by an eminent scholar, Professor Justin Albertson Wickland, my mentor and research collaborator in pediatric endocrinology. She also facilitated my exposure and visit to pediatric endocrinology clinics in Gothenburg. Umea, Slepton, and Amstad. Professor Chester similarly facilitated an extra research travel grant to the ESPA conference in Milan in 2013 with more opportunities for future research collaboration. Growth in pediatrics, the potentials, challenges, and privileges, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. The title of my inaugural lecture is the summation of the field of pediatrics and indeed God's purpose for us to grow and multiply. Growth is defined as a physical increase in body size over time. Every individual has a unique, innate or genetic potential for growth. Indeed, one of the features which distinguish an adult and a child is growth. Potential is defined as having the capacity to develop into something in the future showing latent abilities that may be developed and lead to future success or usefulness. Challenges are hindrances, obstacles or difficulties that may limit potential. Privileges are special rights, advantages granted or available only to a particular person or group. Growth is an essential indicator of the health and nutritional status of a child. Therefore, it is vital to measure and monitor a child's growth. Monitoring the growth of a child requires taking relevant measurements accurately at regular intervals and plotting the values on appropriate growth charts. The standard growth chart derives from international databases of children from various parts of the world are used for the assessment of the growth of children worldwide. Though the growth standard for a population is best drawn from that same population, to minimize variations in interpretation. Unfortunately, it is challenging to meet this condition. Hence, the use of a homogenized population of children from all levels of affluence and social characteristics across the world for a fair representation. Despite the recommendation of this international standard for charts for global use, some developed countries such as Sweden have also drawn up local growth standards for Swedish children. Parents desire that their children should grow, just as every nation wants to say, as growth is a matter of strength. Growth is quantitative and includes dimensions in weight, length or height, among other parameters of assessment. In human beings, growth follows a definite pattern. In an ideal world, all children should have the opportunity to grow to their full genetic potential. However, the childhood growth phase is influenced not only by genes and hormones, but also by nutrition, diseases, social, cultural, and economic factors. This may constitute challenges to a child's growth potential. It is important to note that the genetic effects on growth are small compared with the impact of the environment, nutrition, and diseases. So, growth during childhood will vary in different environments since potential challenges and privileges will differ. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, as growth restrictions originating during the childhood growth phase persist, there is resultant reduced adult height. My researches have shown the impact of socioeconomic status on children's growth and health. These are preventable challenges. Malnutrition contributes to 45% of all child deaths under age 5 in developing countries. With the childhood survival strategies, there has indeed been an improvement 
in childhood morbidity and mortality statistics. Nevertheless, children's rights include the right to health, education, family life, play, and adequate standard of living, protection from abuse and harm. However, beyond survival into the school age, many children from low-income backgrounds, especially in public schools, do not eat enough food outside of school to support their growing bodies and minds. Bill and Melinda Gates have noted that being born American to wealthy parents are some of the factors that were responsible for their ultimate success. The implication is that many children from our environment are already born disadvantaged and with challenges regardless of their innate and genetic potential for growth. Their counterparts in developed countries are no doubt privileged. According to them, when individuals lack such privileges, their probability of being poor is high and hardship is all but guaranteed. There is no doubt that children in this part of the world face enormous challenges in their growth. This, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I shall proceed to illustrate. We start my research activities and scholarship. Child labor among school children in Shagabu local government area of the state Nigeria. Child labor is defined as work that deprives children of their childhood, potential, dignity, and that is harmful to physical and mental development. Child labor is globally topical and generates great interest because it is a societal ill that challenges the growth and health of children. My research activity started formally with the dissertation I submitted to the West African College of Physicians in 1999 with a study of child labor among school children in Shagami local government. Out of 1,675 school children, 64.5% were engaged in child labor. Most of the children involved in child labor did so on the instruction of one or both parents to contribute to family income due to economic challenges in the family. Significantly higher proportions of children with poorly educated parents and an increasing number of children in the family were involved in child labor. Family economic enhancement, high parental education, and small family size would reduce the pressure on parents to engage their children in labor activities, child labor, and occupational hazards. In a study of the hazards encountered by school children engaged in child labor, significantly higher proportions of girls were involved in street trading than boys. About two-thirds encountered work-related hazards, namely physical abuse, verbal abuse, road mishaps, and sexual harassment. Children, especially the girl child, should be protected from child labor-related hazards and only carefully defined home chores of non-economic nature should be allowed. Child labor and school attendance for academic performance. Do working school children have the worst academic performance? The effect of child labor on school children's academic performance was examined. There was no significant difference in the mean rate of school absence, mean aggregate examination scores, and the proportion of class repeaters among working school children versus the controls. However, a significantly higher proportion of the controls high, had high average examination scores compared with the working school children. Similarly, the controls performed better. In each course subject, but significant differences were observed only in social studies and science. There is some undermining of academic performance among children who combine schooling with child labor, despite comparable school absence with the controls. This research provided a methodology to measure the effects of child work on education in our environment. Although the studies did not reflect on growth parameters of the children, the fact that the children have to work to supplement the family income suggests a violation of the rights of the child, as well as the risk of poor nutrition, poor health to which the children were exposed. These are known as risk factors for poor growth in children. This observation is a reflection of the lack of privileges of children in the lower socioeconomic classes. Social pediatrics. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. A known relationship exists between political and economic policies of government and family finances. 
and by extension, the accessibility of healthcare services. Family financing greatly influences healthcare seeking behaviors in settings like ours, where healthcare is financed mainly through out of pocket payment. A drawback of this is the duration of hospital stay for adequate treatment when children are hospitalized. Specifically, when the purchasing power of the family is low, it becomes difficult for the average family to pay the various costs of hospital care. This financial challenge culminates in a tendency to prematurely terminate medical care before completing treatment against the recommendation of the medical team. This is referred to as discharge against medical advice, DAMA. When parents opt to discharge an ill child against medical advice, the decision taken on behalf of the helpless child puts that child at risk of complications of the primary illness and possibly death. In a study of pediatric DAMA at OUTH, Fetuga et al. reported a high prevalence of DAMA with financial constraints being the leading reason. Efforts should be made by the government to create an enabling environment for the financial empowerment of families. Hospitals should have avenues for defending the rights of children to life by preventing them. Pediatric infectious diseases, impacts of infections on those. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, even without apparent symptoms, pathological processes associated with infection can impair growth. Therefore, I research extensively into some of the common infections children encounter in this environment, such as pediatric HIV AIDS, childhood measles, neonatal tetanus, and childhood tuberculosis. The pattern of childhood deaths in Shagami, a method of assessing the quality of healthcare available in any country is to determine the childhood mortality rate in addition to other vital statistics. Reducing childhood mortality was a vital component of the Millennium Development Goals, MDG, which expired in 2015, but is well represented in many ways by the current Sustainable Development Goals, SDG, expected to terminate in 2030. The pattern of childhood deaths in OUTH Agam between 1996 and 2005 was studied for the assessment of the achievement of the fourth MDG. Out of 10,451 pediatric admissions, 1,320 died. Most of the deaths occurred within 48 hours. Protein energy malnutrition accounted for 10% at 8% of deaths among infants and children 8 months to 5 years, respectively. Childhood mortality remained high over the 10 year study period, and the deaths were caused mainly by infections and other preventable conditions. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, 2015 has gone and we have made some improvement in childhood deaths in Nigeria, but we did not achieve the set goal. We are hopeful that before the 2030 target year of the SDG, we will make further progress. Pediatric HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS contributes to childhood mortality, especially when there is poor access to antiretroviral therapy. The top features of childhood HIV AIDS include weight loss. Therefore, this debilitating disease has a prominently negative effect on the growth of children. Although a low prevalence of pediatric HIV AIDS was observed among hospitalized children at the OUT Shagami, it is noteworthy that the clinical features in those children conform to the WHO guidelines for its case definition. In addition, 45.5 of children with HIV AIDS in the study presented the protein energy malnutrition, PEM, demonstrating that HIV AIDS impairs the growth and nutrition of affected children. Measles infection. Measles is a viral infection and a cause of childhood morbidity and mortality. Despite the availability of safe and effective vaccines, it commonly affects non-immune children of the lower socioeconomic group. Protein energy malnutrition is known to complicate severe measles. With superimposed symptoms, the growth of affected children is severely affected. In a study of 164 children hospitalized with measles, 39.4% were raised 12 months old or less, 
with about half of them younger than nine months. This observation is of epidemiological significance since measles vaccination is routinely administered to children at nine months. The role of measles in malnutrition was also demonstrated as a third of the children were underweight. Overall, children without prior measles vaccination, those of low socioeconomic status, and those weighing less than 80% of the expected for age, all had significantly higher mortality rates. The study recommended supplemental immunization activities. It is gratifying that this is currently being implemented in the form of household vaccinations on national immunization days. Neonatal Technos in Shagami. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, Technos plays a significant role in avoidable new contexts. Technos is a fatal but vaccine preventable infection, infectious disease and its incidence is highly related to the degree of poverty and illiteracy in the community. In a study of neonatal tetanus in Nigeria over 15 years, with a change in the country's immunization program from the expanded program on immunization, EPI, to the national program on immunization, FPI, a high mortality rate of neonatal tetanus was observed, and the determinant of mortality in this infant included low socioeconomic class and lack of antitetanus vaccination. Therefore, it might be helpful to further subsidize and improve accessibility to the existing health facilities. School-based and house-to-house -house immunization programs may be more efficient than the routine clinic-based system in ensuring the elimination of neonatal tetanus. In addition, a study of 151 newborns and neonatal tetanus the mortality rate of 63.6 was close to the national mortality rate of 60%. These deaths were significantly associated with low birth weight, low socioeconomic class, among other factors. The findings imply that efforts at improving standard and quality of living and adequate vaccination of pregnant women are germane to reducing neonatal tetanus as a major contributor to newborn deaths. Childhood tuberculosis in Shagam. Tuberculosis TB is a significant cause of childhood morbidity and mortality in the developing world. Children with malnutrition and debilitating diseases are particularly susceptible. Tuberculosis is a disease associated with poor feeding, poor growth, or weight loss among affected children. Therefore, when children have TB, growth is a major casualty. Out of 52 children with TB hospitalized at OUT Chagam, most of them belong to the low socioeconomic classes, and 69% had weight loss. About a third of children with the disease had HIV as a co infection. This study observed that TB is prominent in the lower socioeconomic classes, characterized by poor nutrition, poor housing, overcrowding poor ventilation, and poor access to quality health care. Weight loss, which may serve as a proxy for poor growth, is a prominent feature of childhood tuberculosis. Improved standard of living and routine HIV screening were suggested as useful control measures. Pediatric endocrinology. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, following my subspecialty training, I set up the weekly pediatric endocrinology clinic at the OODTH Shagam in 2010. In this clinic, we attend to children with endocrine disorders such as rickets, diabetes mellitus, overweight, obesity, disorders of the thyroid, puberty, sex development, also known as ambiguous external genitalia, and others. These disorders, without treatment, impact negatively the growth of these children. Some endocrine problems which affect the growth of children, rickets. Rickets is the commonest endocrine disorder seen at a pediatric and clinic in OUTH Chagam. It is a common disorder of bone growth, characterized by poor mineralization of the bone, thus making the bones abnormally soft and easily deformed. Rickets may arise from vitamin D deficiency or in combination with calcium deficiency. Rickets is characterized by short stature, also known as dwarfism, recurrent chest infection, delayed walking, 
a box like head, poor tooth eruption, chest deformities, bending of the legs, and spine, as you can see in the picture of this young child. And because external genitalia, referred to as the disorder of cell development, DSD. This is a condition in which the external genitals are not clearly made of female in structure. The genitals may be incompletely developed as male or female type, or may have characteristics of both sexes in the same child. The most common cause of ambiguous external genitalia in females is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Ambiguous external genitalia may occur as pectoral enlargement, labia fusion, preterminism, also known as undescended testes, and hypospadia. The major challenge in this condition, apart from the life threatening hypertension, is the dilemma of sex assignment before completion of investigation, diagnosis, and treatment. It is well known that an immediate and common question in our society is to ask for the sex of a baby after rejoicing in the same delivery. Being unable to answer this question, seemingly simple, is often very traumatic to the parents and family. As a result, oftentimes we encourage the family to give the baby gender neutral names such as Shola or Sheung, which we don't really identify with a particular sex, and avoid gender specific names such as Peter or Mary or Lati or Rashida. Precocious puberty. Precocious puberty refers to the presence of physical signs of pubertal development, such as breast growth, pubic hair, testicular enlargement, or penal growth at an early age, usually before the age of eight years in girls and nine years in boys. It is usually of no known etiology. Affected children, if untreated, tend to end up as short statured adults. Hypothyroidism. This is an endocrine disorder resulting from deficiency of thyroid hormones and it will be congenital or acquired. The clinical manifestations are abnormally slow metabolism, slow physical and mental activities such as lethargy, sleepiness, constipation, cold intolerance, and growth retardation. The congenital type is prominently characterized by large tongue and prolonged jaundice in the newborn period. It stands out as the most common preventable cause of mental retardation in children. A baby with congenital hypothyroidism is at the risk of irreversible brain damage, particularly affecting intellect. Fortunately, this type of brain damage is preventable if treatment is commenced very early in life with thyroid hormone replacement. In the developed world, Early recognition of congenital hypothyroidism is facilitated by incorporating routine newborn screening for hypothyroidism into perinatal and neonatal care. Unfortunately, we do not currently practice routine neonatal screening for hypothyroidism in this part of the world due to a lack of facilities. However, efforts are being made by pediatric endocrinologists in Nigeria to address this problem the pattern of growth in school children. My focus and research in the sub specialty of pediatric endocrinology are on the growth of school age children. Normal somatic growth is under the influence of human growth hormone. This hormone stimulates the growth of virtually all tissues in the body. Mr. Vice Chancellor Sir, growth monitoring is an essential component of child survival strategies. These strategies are measures globally, instituted globally, to ensure that more children survive, particularly in the resource poor parts of the world, such as ours. These strategies are targeted as the common killers of young children, and the components of the strategies are preventive. Growth monitoring helps with the early detection of childhood illnesses. When children are ill, they either stop feeding, vomit, or the parents deliberately withhold food out of fear. All this cumulatively reduces the intake of calories, enhance the depletion of calories that the child has in reserve, and ultimately stop their growth. In health, growth monitoring is also essential to affirm that children are performing 
according to expectation. Growth is a genetically programmed process that is expected to run its course with the child attaining specific milestones at particular periods in life. Growth is most rapid at particular periods of life. The significance of this milestone is that deprivation of calories at any of these periods significantly reduces the growth rate. The natural cause of growth is hence distorted by poor nutrition, infections, diseases, and poor psychological conditions. Therefore, growth monitoring is essential and it entails measuring the growth of children and interpreting the parameters against universally accepted international standards. Abnormalities of growth may be in terms of short stature or tall stature. Short stature is the result of poor linear growth. It is relative and needs to be defined according to the growth performance of a given population using the relevant reference chart. The essential tool in the identification of short stature is the standard growth curve. Using three growth references, the prevalence of short boys and girls increased significantly with age in Shagami. The prevalence was significantly higher in public than in private schools. There was also an increasing prevalence of short stature with decreasing socioeconomic class. It is noteworthy that overall, the prevalence of tall stature was small in the cohort. Prevalence of short and tall stature is highly dependent on the calendar year of birth of the reference used. Nevertheless, height is socioeconomic dependent. The desirability of local growth standards. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I noted earlier that some countries had developed local growth standards for their children. Initial attempts to draw such local standards for Nigerian children were made by David Molly, a British pediatrician and an emeritus professor of child health. He studied the growth parameters for rural children at Mestile, which incidentally is my mother's hometown. It was during this study among Nigerian children that he developed the very first growth chart, now known as the Road to Health chart. This chart was later modified by the WHO for growth monitoring in the developing world as part of child survival strategy activities. Many years later, a similar study also at Mesile by Oyedeji et al. demonstrated a circular trend characterized by surges in the height of Nigerian children compared to the pattern earlier reported by Molly. Subsequently, there have been pockets of similar studies across Nigeria. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, one of such efforts was made in Shagami, comparing the growth pattern of school children in Shagami with the CDC and WHO standard, using the median weight, height, and body mass index of the school children. The weight, height, and BMI Z scores of the children were less than the reference values provided on the CDC and WHO charts. This observation implies that on average, the Nigerian child in Shagamu grows much less than the international standards. The reasons for this may not be perfect. The factors which impair the growth of children are right in this environment. Poor nutrition and infection as highlighted. The relationship between nutrition and growth is interwoven. Growth is an index of the quality of food, feeding and general well-being. Therefore, often when the growth of a child is assessed, it is closely related to the nutritional status of the child using parameters such as weight for age, height for age, weight for height, and BMI for age. Overweight and obesity are assuming public health importance globally because of the likelihood of persistence from childhood into adulthood and associated complications such as glucose intolerance, hypertension, arthritis, metabolic syndrome, and higher risk of cardiovascular diseases the growth pattern of school children in Shagami. In a study of the nutritional status of 1,016 school children in Shagami, a 39.4% prevalence of malnutrition was reported. Overall, the prevalence of underweight, stunting, and thinness in the study were 25.5, 14.2, 14.3, 14.4, 14.7, 14.8, 14.9, 14.9, 14.9, 14.9, 14.9, 14.9, 14.9, 14.9, 14.9, 14.9, 14.9, 14.
and 22.2% respectively. Interestingly, Mr. Vice Chancellor said, overweight and obesity were also recorded among the cohorts. This observation was interesting because overweight and obesity were either to be regarded as problems of the affluent, Shagamu, a semi-urban setting, cannot by any standard be classified as an affluent community. Therefore, this observation highlights the current trend of double jeopardy in many parts of the developing world. The combination of endemic poor nutrition and emerging overnutrition. There is a high prevalence of undernutrition among school children in Shagami. Growth in pre pubertal Nigerian children. Fetuga et al. also related the weight, height, and body mass index of pre pubertal children in Shagami to parental socioeconomic class while studying 1,557 children from public and private primary schools. The children in private schools were significantly taller and heavier than those in public schools. The median height, SDS, weight, SDS, and BMI of SDS also increased with increasing parental socioeconomic class. Children in the upper socioeconomic classes were taller, heavier, and with higher BMIs than those from lower socioeconomic classes. Growth in pre pubertal Nigerian children is highly dependent on parental socioeconomic status. It stands to reason that with increasing socioeconomic status, parents are better financially empowered to provide good nutrition and protective home environment, which in turn minimizes the risk of infection and diseases. Such parents also have better access to health information and health care, and their children are much less likely to suffer health neglects. Type 1 diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is a chronic disease characterized by absolute or relative insulin deficiency, resulting in high blood glucose, among other features. There are two main types of diabetes, type 1 diabetes, which is commonly found in children, and type 2, which is more frequent in, among adults, apart from causing weight loss in children. The disease is also characterized by infections and growth abnormalities. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, Fetuga et al. provided the first documentation of childhood diabetes editors at OUT Shagami, a major referral center in the Ogun State, providing health care for children in the state and some of the neighboring states, indicating that childhood DM exists among children in Nigeria, contrary to the widely held belief. The children presented with diabetic ketoacidosis DKA, a life threatening complication of the disease. Most of these children with diabetes in the study belonged to the lower socioeconomic classes. One of the major challenges in the management of these children is the fact that they presented for the first time with the life threatening DKA. This reflects the fundamental problem of poor and delay in healthcare scheme behavior in the society until complications arise. In addition, the cost of management of childhood diabetes is high, particularly in terms of the cost of medication, such as insulin, which is the mainstay of treatment, but is rarely readily available and affordable to many affected families. The need for lifestyle modifications and home self-care can also be quite challenging for the affected children and their immediate families. Ideally, such families need the support of funds, psychological needs, and access to care. Unfortunately, when the management of type 1 diabetes is fraught with challenges, the general outcome tends to be poor. This is painful for a condition that is globally known to be amenable to treatment. Conclusion. As I try to bring this inaugural lecture to a close, it is without doubt evident from the preceding that the growth potential of Nigerian children are faced with enormous challenges in terms of, of unfavorable social factors, infections, and endocrine disorders. These challenges are related to or made worse by the low socioeconomic status of their families. Therefore, in conclusion, 
our society must appreciate that pediatrics is different from adult medicine. The petite body of a unit, an infant, or a child is different physiologically from that of an adult. Therefore, treating children is not like treating a miniature adult as children need to grow. Nigerian school children are likely to grow suboptimally when compared with the international standards of the CDC and WHO. Even within the same population, Nigerian children from lower socioeconomic classes have poorer growth patterns compared to those from higher socioeconomic classes. Therefore, disparities in parental socioeconomic status constitute challenges to optimal growth in Nigeria. There is a huge burden of social, infectious diseases, and endocrine factors resulting in undernutrition among Nigerian children, which negatively impact on disease outcomes and growth. Recommendations. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, so that our children may grow and nurture their growth potentials adequately, I made the following recommendations to overcome the challenges, not even as privileges, but emphatically as rights for our children. Our society must accept that although children are minors and cannot make decisions for themselves, Still, the interest of children must be paramount and overriding when adults make decisions on behalf of children. Therefore, issues of guardianship and legal responsibility should be considered in every pediatric care to avoid discharge against medical advice. Dharma. Hospitals should have avenues of defending the rights of children to life and death. Efforts must be made by government at the state and national levels to address the various socioeconomic challenges confronting families and indeed the nation at large through the creation of an enabling environment for financial empowerment of families. This will enhance children's growth by improving nutrition, pre preventing infection, and improving access to quality health care for children. Efforts to reduce the burden and improve disease outcomes and the growth of children in our population should include nutritional surveillance, specific nutritional intervention programs like food supplementation, and compulsory but free midday school meals as a fiscal policy of the government. Periodic growth monitoring of all school children for early recognition and appropriate intervention are vital. The school health services program should be strengthened in both private and public schools for this purpose. There is a need to develop a national group chart for Nigerian children for clinical practice and research. This will require a collaborative effort among pediatric endocrinologists across the six geopolitical zones in the country. Routine newborn screening for hypothyroidism should be institutionalized in neonatal care at all levels of health care. The health sector should put adequate measures in place for sustainable hormone replacement therapies, particularly concerning insulin or diabetes. These hormones should be made available and affordable to these children. Acknowledge me. To God Almighty be the glory and honor for this great privilege that he has afforded me to be alive to deliver this inaugural lecture. It was taken for granted that I would be a medical doctor by my late father of blessed memory since my childhood, the firstborn in a big family. I thank God for making me so academically inclined and that as a girl child, I did not fall victim to health challenges and the many societal ills along the road. I would like to thank all my teachers, living and those who have passed on to the great beyond. This includes from my primary and secondary school as well as the university. Every one of them has contributed significantly in nurturing my God-endowed potential through various challenges to this final model. However, I must mention Mr. Olari Waji, who in my sixth year in my primary school endowed my first taste of cash out in our weekly assessment. 
in my secondary school at Egypt Girls Grammar School, and it's a body. This is Ali Debe, mathematics teacher. And Mama Top, our Yoruba teacher, played prominent roles in ensuring that I was awarded the Western State Government Scholarship throughout my secondary school education. I acknowledge all my teachers in the medical profession at the University of Dubai. Late Professor Ayodele impacted me greatly during my first clinical rotation, of which I was a group captain. In going through the Pediatric Postgraduate Residency Training for the award of the Fellowship in Pediatrics of the West African College of Physicians, I must acknowledge Professor A. A. O. Lajiti, who employed me and inadvertently into the residency program in pediatrics. I appreciate my elders in the Department of Pediatrics, Professor Ayofolami, late Professor Ayofolami, late Professor F. A. Akisode, Professor D. M. Olani Wadi, Professor A. Odogu, Dr. A. Gumuru, Professor O. F. Kujokama, and Professor D. Odogu Wadi. I acknowledge my colleagues in the Department of Pediatrics, Dr. O. D. Ogunfurura, Dr. Mrs. T. I. Nishewiabiyogu, Dr. Mrs. A. F. Adekondi, Professor T. A. Ogunese, and Dr. S. A. Akodu. So also, the resident doctors that have passed through the Department of Pediatrics at OET Chagami until date for their roles in patient care and research. The Chief Medical Director, the entire management staff, nurses in the Department of Pediatrics, all nurses and staff at OET, past and present, are highly appreciated. I'm also grateful to all the academic and non-academic staff of the Faculty of Clinical Sciences and other family of College of Health Sciences, folks, for their immense cooperation. I acknowledge the past days of the Faculty of Clinical Sciences, the past and present provost of folks, the past and present principal officer and deputy vice chancellors of the university. I also acknowledge the past vice chancellors for their various contributions to the growth of our university. My current vice chancellor, Professor Galiu. Hola, Chuchi. Hola, Chuchi. I appreciate you. Continue to rest with this. 
thank you most heavily for coming. Lastly, we also thank the wife of our vice chancellor, who is here present today, Dr. Olai Kanya Salati. Thank you for coming. We thank you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, for attending this event. Shortly, I will ask the deputy vice chancellor to declare this ceremony closed. May I implore you to please, after the ceremony is declared closed, to please stand and remain standing while the academic position will reverse in, uh, will exit in reverse order. May I now invite the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Professor Deji Agwala, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, to please declare this 102nd inaugural lecture closed. Deputy Vice Chancellor. Um, it has been a um, thought-provoking and insightful inaugural lecture. Thank you, Professor Fetigal, for giving us that beautiful lecture. <laughs> Principal Officer of the University, Provost, Deans, members of Senate, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the National Lord, I have to declare this one no second in that one nation close. Thank you. Please remain standing while the procession exits in reverse order.